Well, if you'd like to turn back to page 561 in the church Bibles, if you have one, if you don't have one, then put your hand up and one will be brought to you. Page 561. This morning it's a, it's a one-off sermon from Proverbs chapter 3. Next week we hope to begin a new series on the second letter of Timothy in the New Testament. There's a, a change to what's actually on the uh, bulletin for that in that uh, the plan is now for me to preach that first sermon on 2 Timothy next Sunday morning, James then to preach in the evening next Sunday. But for now, we're in Proverbs chapter 3, page 561. Uh, There are sermon searches for young people, and there are uh, prizes uh, today for Aaron, Barnabas, Betty, Eden, and Noah, if they'd like to see me afterwards for those. So chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, famous verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You want to do it well, don't you? You're just starting uni or uh, back for another year. You're in a a new class at school or perhaps a, a, a new school. You've begun a new job, you've got married, you've had a baby, perhaps you've recently retired, or you're uh, getting involved in a, in a ministry in, in the church, or perhaps you've just received some difficult news which brings big change in your life, and whatever it, it is, you want to do it skillfully, you want to navigate it well, and this text from the Bible, it, it tells you how to do that, how to, how to live well, even if you're just sort of bumping along in the bottom, as it were, doing the humdrum things that you've, that you've done for, for a long while. Uh, the book of Proverbs is an ancient book of wisdom that's very much up to date, A lot of the book consists of two-liners, doesn't it? What we actually usually think of as proverbs. Better is a meal of vegetables where there's love than a fattened calf with hatred. But the first few chapters of the book are more a a father, a wise father, (coughs) speaking to his son and showing him who he should trust and who he who he shouldn't trust. So in his first fatherly talk in chapter one, he says, don't don't listen to bad advice from people who are trying to get to the top by trampling on others. And in the second chapter, he says, don't trust people with hidden agendas. In chapter five, he tells his son not to trust in a woman who offers him easy sex outside of marriage. And in this chapter, he tells him that he he should trust in the loving, faithful, all-wise, ever-dependable Lord God. Trust in him, he says, with all your hearts. Now, trust is, is big, isn't it? Trust is vital in good relationships. Just like an engine runs on oil, so friendship really runs on trust, doesn't it? So if you've trusted a a friend with your house key and then you come home unexpectedly one day and you find that friend slipping quietly out of your front door, you can't help wondering, can you, what she's up to? But if you do actually trust her, you'll say to yourself, I don't know what she's doing, but I do know that it's not against me. I do know that it's going to be for my good. It's not against me. She's for me. I trust her. But if, uh, as you see her, you wonder whether she's going to be making off with the family silver, then it's fairly obvious that you don't actually trust her. Uh, To trust someone, you see, is to have confidence in them, isn't there? To, To... to to trust their reliability, to have a firm belief in their good intentions. 
I guess the bottom line is when you really trust someone, you feel safe, don't you? You feel safe with that person. So in these well-known verses, we have three exhortations. An, an exhortation is something which tells us what we must or mustn't do. Exhortation number one, trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Number two, do not lean to your own understanding. Number three, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And then there's a promise. There's three exhortation, exhortations, and then there's a promise. He will direct your paths. So trust in the Lord with all your hearts. You can put your trust in God unreservedly. That stands to reason when you think who God is. You're absolutely safe with him. That's what the text says. He's the God who made you. He's the God who knows you. He's your creator. But we learn to trust him, you know, even better as our savior, as our Redeemer, for in his gift to this world and to us of Jesus Christ, his call on us is to trust him. The way that God chooses to save us is by calling us to trust in him. He saves us by trust, through trust, as we come to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Trust his perfect life, the perfect life of Jesus. Trust his obedience. Trust his finished work. In these things you find a solid rock that you can lean on. Faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life is about depending entirely on God, isn't it? So the Apostle Paul talks about receiving the atonement. The atonement is that wonderful work of Jesus by the shedding of his blood, by which he makes us right, to God, right with God. What we have to do is simply to receive it, to believe it, to accept it. Simply trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us uh, for eternal life by sacrificing himself to make us right with him. We're justified by faith. We believe from the heart. We believe with all our heart. And we say, I am trusting you, Lord Jesus, trusting only you for life and for, for, for forgiveness. Yes, we trust him as our creator and as our savior and as our provider. We trust his promises. In Jesus Christ, God promises all things that we need. In one place, the Apostle Paul says, all things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He belongs to God. All things belong to him, and therefore, if you belong to him, all things belong to you, fundamentally and absolutely. Therefore, trust in him with all your hearts for everything all things really do work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You might not always find it easy to see that, but trust in God is always worth it. Even though you don't understand what God is doing in your life or why the difficulties that come to you and the problems that you have, and some of them are big ones, why these things come into your life, uh, but... Uh, you do understand that the trust, the call of God is to trust him with all your heart in all these things. He doesn't give us all that we want, does he? But he does give us all that we need. And he's always for us. We know that God is always for us. If God is for us, who can be against it? Like the fr against us, like that, that friend slipping out of the front door, we may be sometimes surprised and puzzled by what God is doing, by what God is allowing in our lives. We don't understand it, but the bottom line is that we can have a complete confidence in him. He is our rock, and we have joy and peace 
in believing. It's a great thing to have. It's a very, these are very simple things I'm saying this morning. But if you, they're very real things to have joy and peace in believing. And it's, it's consistent with things going quite badly wrong in our lives from a human point of view. In, in fact, our trust in God can only really be tested and deepened as things do go wrong in our lives. We learn things about God and ourselves when things go wrong, don't we, that we wouldn't otherwise learn. And the wise man uh, says this in his fatherly advice a little bit further down, in a few verses down, he says in verse 11 to his son, my son, do not despise the, the chastening of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord, nor detest his correction. That's a strong word, detest, isn't it? Don't react violently against God's correcting hand upon your life. For whom the Lord loves, that's such a tender word, isn't it? For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, just like a father loves his son. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and corrects every son whom he receives. As, as, a, as a father, the son in whom he delights. Any good father will discipline and train his children. And God is a good father, isn't he? And he is to be trusted. And he's to be trusted especially when things go wrong or not according to perhaps what we would have planned. So Jesus said to his disciples, and he says it to us, let not your hearts be troubled. Perhaps you come here today and your heart is troubled. Hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you very personally. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So the exhortation is for us to trust God wholeheartedly, not with doubts, not with questions, not half-heartedly. Real trust is like this, isn't it? Real trust is, is total. That's the strength of a really strong marriage, isn't it? You can totally trust each other. And if that gets put to the test, well, then the thing to do after that is to try to rebuild trust, isn't it? Trust is the great thing in, in, in a marriage. But when the object of trust is God himself, well, that's really cast iron security, isn't it? God is the object of your trust. That can't go wrong, can it? Even the best of people can let us down, but not God. You can, you can trust in him and in his word with all your heart. You can lean the whole weight of your trust on him. The Bible talks about us um, departing from God. How do we depart from God? How do we go away from God? It says, through an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief is the problem. When we go away from God, the problem is always unbelief. We were just singing just now, be gone unbelief. We want it to go, don't we? We don't want unbelief. Be gone, unbelief. My Savior is near. And it's wonderful when unbelief is chased out of our hearts because it's by an evil heart of unbelief that we depart from God. And so when we stop looking to Jesus, when we trust in our own goodness or spirituality, we're rejecting what God has said to us about his own Son and about how we're made right with him through him. When we, when we turn away from God to look for help from, uh, from other things, uh, then we're guilty of unbelief, aren't we? Uh, I wonder whether you're really trusting God today. C can you say to God, well, I, I trust you to, to use what I wouldn't choose? Even when I don't understand, I trust you. There's a prayer of one of the kings of Judah, King Asa. Uh, he was in trouble. And he said, he prayed like this. He said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. There's no one like you. 
the incomparable God. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rely on you. It's a simple prayer, isn't it? Help us, for we rely on you. It's a great thing to rely on God. And God loves it when we take him at his word. He loves it when we do this, when we believe his promises. So trusting God needs to be entire, but it also needs to be exclusive. And that's why we come to the second exhortation. Do not lean to your own understanding. Trust in God with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. Now, our default position is to trust ourselves, isn't it? And to trust our own thinking. And so when we turn our ideas away from uh, our hearts, away from trusting God, uh, we tend to trust in our own wisdom and our own ideas and our own intellects. Certainly we're informed by others, we're definitely influenced by others, always in the way uh, we think. Uh, but um, uh, we, we, we tend at root to be trusting in ourselves. And it, it's dangerous to do that. It's, it's flimsy to do that. Oh, I hope you can see that. It's a flimsy uh, ground for trust. When you're climbing a ladder, you need to find a, a solid surface to lean it against, don't you? You lean it against a wall. You'd rather lean it against a wall than you would lean it against a bush. The danger with climbing up a ladder when it's leaning against a bush is that it falls right through the bush, doesn't it? It hasn't got the strength to support you. And it's like that when you're leaning in your life and for your thinking, you're just leaning on your own understanding. The whole thing is likely to cave in. If you lean on your own understanding on the great issue of being right with God, uh, then it will that will let, your let you down, your own understanding about salvation and about your own righteousness will let you down. If you, lean on, if you lean on your own righteousness, it will certainly let you down. Uh, when you lean on your own understanding of the things that are happening to you, well, that's flimsy. Difficult things in your life that are happening to you right now, you, you're trying to make sense of it, don't lean on that, that's, that's flimsy. It's not the kind of understanding that comes from trusting God and his word. word. When, we, when we just rely on our own understanding without God, then we get it wrong, don't we? And we get it wrong about all kinds of things. We get it wrong even about what's going on in the world, how we interpret the, the news. We get it wrong about science. We get it wrong about religion and other religions. We get it wrong about the sanctity of, of human life. We get it wrong about sexuality. We get it wrong about all manner of things when we lean to our own understanding. And we're inclined to listen much more attentively to the voices of a secular and humanistic culture when we lean to our own understanding. And you'll be inclined to rebel against God when you do that, in the, especially in the difficult things of your life. Of course, it doesn't mean that we stop thinking. We, we need to think things through. We need to try to understand what God is doing in our lives. God has given us brains, and we need to use them. Uh, but our understanding needs to be properly informed by God's word, doesn't it? and properly submitted to God. We need to submit our understanding to God. Are you willing to do that in your life? At the heart of real Christianity is submission, you know. Submission to God, to who he is, to his word, to his promises. I wonder whether you're really willing to do that. And if, if you are, then it, it'll show in the way you live. Sometimes uh, when you look at a tree, you can tell from the tree the direction of the prevailing wind, can't you? You can tell the way the wind mostly blows. And you can tell that by the way the tree is kind of leaning. Uh, and it's the same with you and your life. Uh, the way you are leaning in your life can be seen. 
It's visible. The prevailing influence on your life can be seen in your lifestyle, in your behavior, in your values, in your priorities, in the way you spend your time. And the question is, are you leaning on God? Or are you leaning on your own understanding of things? Are you leaning on God's word? Are you leaning on God's promises? What I'm saying just now, if you are, then it will show. It will, be, it will become evident. What's the prevailing influence in your life? Where do you go for instruction? Where do you go for guidance? Where do you go for truth? What we were hearing about last week, about the righteous person in Psalm 1, who delights in God's Word and who meditates in the Word of God day and night. Well, that is very relevant, isn't it? Um, it's very relevant to us not leaning on our own understanding. So we have a positive exhortation, trust in the Lord with all your heart. We have a negative exhortation, do not lean to your own understanding. And then we have another positive one, in all your ways, acknowledge him. One of my grandfathers used often to be rather preoccupied as he was uh, walking on his own. And one day, one of his daughters passed him in the street in the town, and to kind of test him out, she, she said, good morning, Mr. Watts. And uh, he removed his hat because he was a gentleman, and that's what you did in those days if you were a gentleman. He removed his hat and he said, good morning, and he walked on. He didn't recognize, he, didn't, he, did, he, he sort of acknowledged her, it was a sort of nodding gesture, but he didn't, he, he didn't realize it. it was his own daughter who had said good morning to him. He was so preoccupied. And uh, that's, not, that's not what it means when it says in all your ways acknowledge him. It's not just a nodding gesture, it's not just taking your hat off to the Lord and saying, yes, I believe you're there. It's more than that, isn't it? it, it it's about a relationship. It's about, it's about knowing him. It's about recognizing somebody and affirming that person. If you're in, in a room and someone, and the room's full of people and someone comes into the room who you, who you know well, you're not going to ignore that person, are you? You're going to, you're going to greet them, you're going to acknowledge them. Uh, everyone in the room will come to know that that person is your friend. That person is, is known to you. There's a, a kind of pre-existing relationship there. If it was your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse who came into the room, well, it would be very strange if you didn't identify yourself with them, wouldn't it? It'd be really odd if you didn't identify yourself with them. And so it says, in all your ways, acknowledge God in everything that you do. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't try to live a compartmentalized life in which you're just sort of giving God a nod, as it were, on a Sunday. Are you doing that? Giving God a nod on a Sunday. What about the rest? What about the rest of your life? What about the rest of the week? If you only cultivate part of your garden and you leave the rest to grow weeds, well, the weeds are soon going to take over, aren't they? Eventually, they're going to take over. They're going to dominate. And so it is if you neglect God in your life, in the whole of your life. You can't keep just corners of your life away from God, you know. Perhaps you're trying to do that. But the fatherly advice to the son is in all your ways, in all of your life, acknowledge him. You can't keep sort of exclusive control of one area of your life. You see, it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, you mustn't love God and money. He said, you cannot love God and money. It can't be done. You can't love both. 
You can't get away with it. You can't love God and love money. You end up loving one and hating the other, always. So you, you can't say, I'm going to trust God for everything else. I'm going to trust God for my salvation. But I'm the one who's managing my, my, my money, thank you very much. I'm the one who's managing my bank account. You can't do that. No, in the way you ha handle your money, as in all your ways, you need to be acknowledging God, your relationship with God, the reality of God. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. So what it means if you're on your own with your PC or with your iPad or your iPhone and it's late at night and there's no one else around and there are all kinds of, uh, of sites that you could visit that, you're gonna, that you are going to do you no good at all. In fact, you know they're going to do you positive harm. What do you do? You stop. You acknowledge God, don't you? In that scenario, God is there. God is with you. You may be on your own otherwise, but God is with you. He knows you. He sees you. And so in that moment, you need to acknowledge God. And it will make a whole lot of difference in how you behave, won't it? What you do next. What you do next. It's so important. What you do next when you're in that situation. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Acknowledge his word. Acknowledge his wisdom. And do that in the rules that you make for yourself in your life. Acknowledge him. So when you're at work and your, your boss or your line manager tells you to cut a corner or to tell a lie or to do some unethical business, you know that God is there in that situation. And in all your ways, you must acknowledge not only your boss, but you must acknowledge God. You must recognize him, and you must recognize him first. I'm reading a book just now about Christians in the army in the First World War, and often they found themselves, you know, in, in very cramped barracks full of other men, men who didn't fear God, men who didn't love God, men who would probably mock them if they thought that they were religious or too religious. What were they going to do? Were they still going to read their Bibles? Some of them were in the habit of kneeling when they prayed at night. Were they still going to kneel by their bed at night time? It was, a, it was a real issue, wasn't it? Were they in all their ways, in every situation, were they going to be acknowledging God? And how do you acknowledge God? Well, certainly as you pray to him. Certainly as you depend on him. As you call on him for help. As you read his word, you acknowledge him, don't you? As you seek his wisdom, his guidance in your life, do you do that? Are you doing that? In all your ways, acknowledge him. And now the promise. What a wonderful promise. Linked with the exhortations, isn't it? He will direct your paths. You know, the Romans were famous for building straight roads, uh, the Foss Way and Watling Street. And... Uh, a, there's something satisfying about a straight road, isn't there? It kind of works. It's, it's functional. And when you trust in God with all your heart, and when you do not lean to your own understanding, and when in all your ways in your life you try to acknowledge him, then it kind of works. That's what this is saying. It works. God will direct your paths. This is the promise. He will lead you on a straight road, a road that leads to the right destination. There is a sense, you know, in which the Christian life is a straightforward life. It's not rocket science. It's not difficult. Because it's all about simply trusting God, listening to God, following God. God. Now, of course, we must do our part. And in the very next chapter, at the end of the chapter, it says, let your eyes look straight ahead 
and your eyelids, eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Think about the direction that you're taking and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. These are all things that we must do. But God's word is full of the, this promise to his people that he will, as we do that, he will lead us. He will direct our paths. You will hear a voice behind you, it says in Isaiah. Uh, not an audible voice, uh, but uh, as you read the Bible, as you pray, as you look at circumstances in your life, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Live it out. God's people are a guided people, you know. And it's a great thing to be guided by God. We are people of promise. And by his word and by his providence and by his love, God directs our paths. Know that you are directed by God as you put your trust in him. One of the old writers says this. He says, when we interest God in our affairs by prayer, we may cast away every care and walk on cheerfully, believing he will guide every step of our journey. Walk on cheerfully, brothers and sisters, as you put your trust in God. And looking back, you'll be able to say, he led me forth by the right way. That's the way you want to go, isn't it? He led me forth by the right way. Sometimes when you're in a building like this, at night time, and it's all dark, you go into one of the rooms, perhaps one of the cloak rooms there, you open the door, and you've got to hover around by the door, you're looking for the light switch. Has that happened to you sometimes? Where's the light switch? Don't know where it is. But you'll never find it whilst you're hovering around by the door. What you've got to do is to step right into the room, and the light comes on automatically. Wonderful, isn't it? How does that happen? That's what, it, that's what happens. It comes on. That's what you've got to do. It's no use just tinkering around at the edge in terms of trusting God. It's no use you just saying, well, where is it? How do I get in? How do I do this? You've got to step right in. You've got to trust in God. You've got to trust him for your salvation. You've got to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to be your savior. You've got to trust him for life. You've got to trust him for eternity. Trust him for everything in your life. Trust him for guidance. Step right into it. Don't be afraid to do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Amen.